Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Ranjan Minter to give me an opportunity to interact with people like you who are going to be our future of this country and indeed the world. My topic for today is about leadership and NGO, an interesting journey. So there, there are three components in this topic. One is leadership, one is the NGO, and the third part is the journey. Now, I am a cardiologist who has practiced globally for the last 30 years and has seen a lot of ups and downs in the innovations of technology in the cardiological field. So I would like to have this as an interactive lecture if it's possible. So may I ask you, would anybody know what the cost of a heart surgery is in India today? How much? Two to five lakhs. Two to five lakhs. Yeah. Uh, that is in the top corporate hospitals. Average is about two lakhs. And the cost of the surgery, say about 15 to 20 years ago, how much was it? <coughs> Any idea? Same heart surgery. is actually the double of what it used to be today. So, given the fact that the surgical cost has come down to half what it used to be a decade ago and the technology has actually trebled or quadrupled in the last 10 years from where we are, are say maybe in the 1990s and 2000s. So that says a lot about what cardiological process has gone through. So if we talk about the Indian landscape about the health scenario, the Indian government spends about 1% of its GDP on public health care, which is awfully low. And overall expenditure on health is about 5% of the GDP, where the Asian average is actually 6%. And the number of physicians per thousand population is 0 0.5, which is one of the lowest in the world. If you compare it to even some developing countries and underdeveloped countries, still their number of physicians per thousand populations is close to 2 to 3. So the recommendations for the WHO is about a doctor per one doctor per thousand and at the moment we are actually one doctor per 1700 patients. So we have about 6 to 6.5 lakh doctors available in India where we actually require about 4, more, four lakhs more by 2020. And the doctors who are required <coughs> spread between 50,000 doctors in the primary health centers about 80,000 doctors in the community health centers, 1.1 lakh doctors for the sub-centers and another 50,000 doctors for the medical college hospitals. And 4 lakh doctors which we have a gap is very, very difficult actually to bridge. And this is in the whole Indian scenario. So what are the next steps? We needed a change of how we think and our, how our health system functions and what could bring the change. Do you think it could be a policy change in the way we are functioning at the moment? Do you think that we require to produce more doctors, have more medical colleges and have more doctors <coughs> coming up? But I don't think that that is the way forward because we have populations increasing at the same time and we cannot cope up a match with the number of people who are going to come compared to the doctors we are going to produce because you have to understand that medical profession is such that just by producing numbers is not enough to require quality to actually deliver number one and number two more importantly you require to actually have the motivation to deliver as well so is it the leadership in implementing new ideas and processes the previous presentation which you 
gave was on Arvind High Hospital and it was all actually about leadership, about a man who actually thought about what could be done. Nobody thought about it, maybe a lot of people thought about it, but nobody had the guts or the motivation to implement it. And I believe that people like him in the 70s and 80s, when they started off in a very modest man manner and where they are today is actually uh, kudos to the leadership which they have. So I have with me today one of the leaders of the heart care or the cardiac care in the Indian scenario and who do you think could be a leader? One with a compelling personal history, one who have a distinctive profile of beliefs and impressive accomplishments in the face of odds. So these are the three things which actually define a leader. So Dr. Devi Prashad Shetty uh, is a very well-known uh, cardiac surgeon and more importantly, one of the most impressive leaders in the medical field I have ever come across. And believe me, I have been to a lot of countries and worked in a lot of countries and I have not seen many people who actually have the vision of what Dr. Shetty had. And more importantly, what Dr. Shetty dreamt during the 1990s, he was actually able to deliver today when we start in 2016. And he thinks the power of a leader is not in the asset or the bank balance. It is the number of talented, passionate people who are willing to follow the leader to build an institution. A person who has the loyalty of the maximum number of these people is the most powerful person. And that's <coughs> my definition is his leader. And Dr. Shetty's model, unlike the Arvind Eye Hospital model, is not actually only a family model. People like us who have been associated with Dr. Shetty since the 1990s have, have stuck around. The attrition rate in Dr. Shetty's institutions is extremely low. People who go to him and work with him actually stick to him nearly for the rest of their career. And that's an excellent quality of a leader. And his vision of Narayana Health, which is his brainchild, is an affordable quality <coughs> health care for the masses. It is not a subsidized health care, it is not an inexpensive health care, but it is something which you can afford and that is very, very important while you are delivering health care. So in 1989, Dr. Shetty, after he returned from UK, he joined the BM Birla Heart Research Foundation in Calcutta and then he moved on and he understood that a lot of well-equipped hospitals are unaffordable by the underprivileged sections of the society. So in 2000, he promoted the Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences and in 2001, he moved on to Bangalore where he actually has the Narayana Health Institute. So Mother Teresa was, now Saint Teresa was his inspiration. He was his, her doctor in the last five years of her life and Dr. Shetty says that I truly believe she was not an ordinary human being like us. She had a true gift, being able to bring a smile to people. And she said to Dr. Shetty that hands that serve are more sacred than the lips that pray. And she was truly an inspiration. And what were his observations? He thought that 80% of the healthcare expenses were born out of pocket, which was actually true and probably still is true because our insurance model in this country is extremely low compared to say anywhere in the western country or any developed country. He also found that 47% of the rural and 37% of the urban population either borrowed money or sold assets to pay for medical expenses. And mind you, the cardiac care is an extremely expensive proposition. Any heart surgery would cost, even today, close to about two lakh rupees at least in any hospitals. That's the basic cost. It could be more. <coughs> and only 120,000 heart surgeries used to be performed in 1990s where there was a need for actually double of that. So his beliefs were the quality of healthcare with good, with low cost. That was one of the things. And medical treatment of the highest quality should be available even to those who could not afford it. Therefore, the cost of the surgery had to come down. So, whenever we have to actually we have to talk 
about these kind of models and has to have meetings together with the administrations, with the managers. He was actually a manager's or administrator's nightmare because he used to have a vision and he wanted it to be implemented. And the rest actually were the people in the background who had to work around it to deliver it. So he was kind of a, kind of a dictatorial thing when it came to his vision about what he wanted to deliver. The people around him, the medical professionals, also understood that if you work with Dr. Shetty, as with the Arvin High Hospital, your volumes would be high, the skill levels would develop, but your take home would be much lower compared to, say, any other hospitals in those days. And what he said was very important that charity is not scalable, but a sound business model is. So his model was to subsidize patients with a lesser paying capacity, the way Urban High Hospital did. He had private wards where patients paid and he used to subsidize patients. And in 2004, the proportion of patients who paid NH full price to those who could not afford to pay was about 60 to 40. Again, the volume game was the key to the whole area without compromising on the quality. He performed the number of heart procedures performed every day was almost eight times the average of other Indian hospitals. When we used to start our career, or even in the middle of our career, we used to see that heart care or the heart ICUs were always in cubicles where patients were isolated. Dr. Shetty was the first person who actually devised ways of actually opening up the cubicles. It was so that if you had five patients one besides another, they just divided by a curtain if required. You had lesser number of personals, nursing personals for the paramedics to actually watch over the patients. So that was the first kind of steps where it broke the myths about subsidizing the heart care. If you if you spent less on personals, if you spent less on equipments, if you spent less on other areas, and if your volumes are high, obviously the cost would automatically come down. The other thing which was very revolutionary on those days were actually the machines. A cath lab machine where we perform our angioplasties and angiograms would cost anything around 5 crores in those days. 5 crores. The HPs and the Philips and the Siemens used to charge those money. And today, when Dr. Shetty's hospital Narayana Health has at least 50 to 60 or 70 to 75 cath lab machines all across India, we don't buy machines anymore. The company, they park the machines and we give them a monthly rent and the maintenance cost is theirs and they take money from us. So that's the way we actually operate nowadays. So the purchase of machines, not only in the high sector areas, but also in the labs and different areas are all on a rental basis. So we, it's, it's a kind of a cost sharing and a profit sharing we go by. And the other important thing was the use, using of generic drugs. So we have, today we have Kiran Shramajumdar who, who we have tied up and our drugs in the NH groups are mostly generic and obviously the cost of the drugs are much, much less. This is actually one area of, in life where things have actually halved in terms of cost from what it used to be in the 90s or 2000s. Now coming to the hospital which started it all was Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences in Kolkata and it started off in 2000, in the year 2000 and it had the privilege of providing service to not only the people of West Bengal but also the neighboring districts in Eastern India as well as the northeastern states apart from countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar and so forth. At the moment we have 613 beds, which is one of the highest in the city. We have 14 state-of-the-art OTs with 6 exclusively for cardiac surgeries, 3 cath labs, 1 pacemaker lab, 160 critical care beds, which is about double of what any other hospital has, and 28 bed emergency department. And the next best number is actually close to about 10. So we are more than double when it comes to emergency department and we have a good laboratory service. 
the emergency department being so big is so important in actually getting into the emergency cardiac care because we are in the heart care business so any heart attacks or any other acute cardiac problems requires to have a good emergency services. You could have a big hospital with a lot of beds but if your emergency services are not good or not big you will not be able to accommodate them. So <coughs> after actually the Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences came to force we get a lot of district patients to come. Now, this was my personal endeavor along with Dr. Shetty's ideas that we need to also focus on the underprivileged in the urban settings. And this was one of the areas which I thought were important. This is the film fraternity where they have the technicians who were very, very low salary and did not have any kind of insurance or people to look after them. Even the film fraternity, the artists who are in the older generations didn't have any health security with them. So we decided that we are going to issue them privileged health cards. We provided them with insurance. We tied them up with the artist forum where they actually pay a nominal fee for the insurance and we delivered them privileged health cards. We, have, we actually have about 2,500 of these technicians from the film studios who are tied up with us. We have different kind of ventures in the urban areas where the underprivileged are looked after. And this was one of my passions from my childhood, cricket. So CAB or Cricket Association of Bengal is actually one of the richest uh, board in the world in terms of the money. But the lowest rung, lowest denominator in this whole association were actually the ground staff or the Malis which we call them. And they are the people without whom the whole infrastructure of the game doesn't advance. But unfortunately, there were no insurances, no health checkups, no camps to look after them. So we decided actually to go into these areas and recently we went, went to the free health camp and looked after these people in a very, very comprehensive manner. And we have also issued them with health cards and we will look after them. So, so this was actually the whole idea behind how we looked into the healthcare business for the underprivileged sections of the urban media. The next focus was actually on the rural health and my heading is actually the rural reluctance. So what do you mean by rural reluctance? Rural reluctance is actually by definition where trained doctors, trained medical professionals do not want to go to the rural settings to treat patients. The government of India, government of the different countries have tried their best to put these people, people like us who have just graduated, going into the rural settings. Unfortunately, because of different reasons, it is not only the pay skill, but because of the infrastructure which you have, because of the lack of facilities which they have, people like the young doctors, they do not want to go to the rural settings. People have tried, the government have tried penalizing them, it didn't work. The reasons you have to understand is, first of all, when you are in the classrooms, when you are graduating, you are actually exposed to the most of the advanced technologies which you have in the country. And suddenly from this area, you are thrown into the rural diaspora, the villages, where you are actually exposed to nothing. You don't have medicines. You have a patient in front of you who has multiple problems and you have a stethoscope <coughs> to just diagnose those problems. So it was, I thought, a huge disparity between the training which you received in your classrooms and suddenly you are exposed to the worst of the scenarios. So I believed always that the most experienced people, the most experienced doctors actually should go to the places in the rural settings where you have scarce availability of facilities. Your experience can actually deal with those problems. The inexperienced, the greenhorns should be actually gradually developing experiences in the urban settings. So, the rural health landscape is actually very scary. 
of the 700 million people living in about 6 lakhs villages, 66% do not have any access to critical medicines. 31% of the population travels more than 30 kilometers to seek healthcare in rural India. So we do not know exactly what happens to the people when they have acute problems. Lack of basic investigation tools to diagnose heart problems, lack of awareness of heart friendly habits and environments, primary to secondary healthcare has very little focus on heart care and 80% of the population in rural India is served by 20% medics with little or no infrastructure for basic healthcare and here is the skew. We have 78% doctors in the urban area treating 20% of the patients whereas the majority of the patients or population in the rural India have no doctors to look after. So what were the solutions to healthcare in rural India? These are my suggestions which I thought that e-health is the only way forward and it has to be done in a spoken hub model which I am going to discuss or elaborate in a little while. The government organizations, the non-government organizations, the international agencies need to pull in the resources. You just cannot depend on any particular kind of organization. It has to be a pan across the whole globe. Any, any help is actually desirable. Any help is welcome. And go hard on the awareness drive, keeping the social cultural issues in mind. When you travel into villages, when you travel into the rural areas, you will understand that there is a huge social cultural divide which divides the urban from the rural population. And that you have to keep in mind while you are dealing with this population. So my mentor, I would say, is Dr. Devi Shetty, who I know him since 1989, and we have shared a lot of dreams together in delivering quality, affordable healthcare for the Indians. And we joined hands in setting up the Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences in 2000. And we share the same inspiration with St. Teresa. I happened to be meeting her in 1996 or 96 I think in one of the programs where we were together and this was a beautiful thing she said that not all of us can do great things but we can all do small things with great love and that is I think the key to what I believe and what inspired me to do what I try to do today. So this is actually a village called Moinapur and it was my trust to destiny. It's in Bakuda, which is the district of West Bengal. It is located 50 kilometers towards the east from the district headquarters of Bakuda and 200 kilometers from Kolkata by train. The population census said there were about 19,853 people who live in Moinapur. The demographics of the health and the healthcare in Bakuda is the population is about 35 lakhs, medical college of about one. District Hospital 1, Rural Hospital 5, Primary Health Center 17, Sub Center 508 and Blood Bank 1. Except the Medical College, the rest of the other facilities, medical facilities is very very scarce in the district of Bakura. So as we travel into that place, these are the beautiful sceneries when we travel there and these are these some sites of that particular place. It is a very, very old village, about 350 years old. People like Vindar Shagar, who are one of the luminaries of the world, actually have traveled there. And the buildings which you see on the top are about 300 years old, still standing. And if you see the bottom corner, this is the jungle areas which people have to travel to sometimes. So the nearest hospital is about 60 kilometers away, the primary health center is about 20 kilometers away, there is no ambulance, there is no registered medical practitioners and the first camp which I did was in 2014. So when we did the first heart camp in 2014 we had about 250 patients who attended and I was the first specialist who actually went into the village in their history. So after a couple of camps, we decided to form a registered 
Foundation and the name was Moinapur Rural Healthcare Foundation. We had all the components added into this name and it was founded on the 15th of August 2015 by the people of Mayanapur. We involved a lot of people of Mayanapur and it facilitates access to tertiary health care with the people of the Mayanapur adjoining villages. Now this model is something which I am going to describe. The vision of Mayanapur Rural Healthcare Foundation the healthcare is the fundamental right of every citizen of India and it's not about charity. It, this facilitates the delivery of the right to healthcare facilities for individuals of Mayanapur and adjoining villages. This is in a very, very nascent state and this is more of an idea which we are trying to implement rather than what we have really achieved in the last couple of years. The objectives are reaching to the economically underprivileged rural heart patients, and we need to diagnose the critical heart problems in the children and adults. Now this is where I have to say that diagnosis of a heart problem is so very important before you actually start treating them. If you don't know what you have, you don't know what to treat. You can have all kinds of statistics, all kinds of prevalence, incidence reports about how much heart problems are in a particular area, but it's no good unless actually you diagnose them. And what the MRHF does is also to have a rural-urban connect and the other important thing which we do is follow up the treated patients. So unlike the previous foundation, unlike what Dr. Shetty does, we are not into the business of treating patients surgically. We are more of a facilitator, we are more of a pickup diagnosis and then to see what best can be done for them and also, more importantly, to have these patients be followed up because there is no facilities where actually the patients are seen by any doctor at any point of time in this particular village and the surroundings. The methodology has been again through heart camps and I have a 24-7 communication lines open with particular couple of people there and we have e-health and we facilitate. The dates of the heart camps are more or less fixed. We do it on public holidays. It's 26th of January, March, 15th of August, and during the Durga Puja. We have two colleagues of you who will be traveling with me on the 12th of October for having the heart camp there. The venue is actually a primary school which was established in 1868, and the uh, headmaster or the principal of that school actually were always kind enough to give the school during these public holidays. So that's the venue of the heart camps. We do ECGs, we do the basic bloods, I do the consultations with my colleagues, and these are non-chargeable. And we have the pamphlets, which we distribute for advertisements for the camps, for the dates of the camps, and also through the cable TV operators. So these are some pictures of the heart camps. On the left hand side of the screen, we have this heart camp venue in the school and I do a public awareness talk before the heart camp and sometimes after the heart camps. So people I try to encourage them to come over and we just talk about some basic issues and it's more of an interactive session which we have. So these are the MRHF members. These are members who are originally from the village but are working indefinitely in some urban places, particularly some, some, some people in Calcutta and some in other areas of the <coughs> country. And this is the meeting which we take place uh, during the uh, camps which we have. And this is the MRHF executive body meeting which is happening. This is a picture of that. The NH team consists of myself and my secretary and the heart camp coordinator and a couple of doctors from time to time. And this is one of the pictures of the camp which is undergoing in a classroom. So after that we have come to the state where we have collaboration with another NGO who were interested in the e-health. The e-health I thought were 
one of the important areas besides the heart camps where we can connect with these heart patients in the villages in a very consistent manner throughout the year. So we have coordinators, one at the Calcutta end, and we have a coordinator at the Moynapur end. We have a rural health practitioner at Moynapur. Now, what is a rural health practitioner? He is not a qualified doctor. He is actually one of the pharmacists who has been there for many, many years and he knows the place, the area very well and he is a very trusted individual there. And he does the screening of the patients. We have a cable broadband connection and I see about 100 patients a month. This is one of the EOPD in progress. On your left hand side is the Calcutta end and this is the Moynapur end and this gentleman in the middle is the rural health practitioner on the left hand side is the coordinator and that is the young patient with his mother.
The model is facilitating free heart camps and public awareness campaigns in association with NH ISS to facilitate free OPD consultation to tertiary care heart specialists. Funding is self-funding so far with some CSR funding from the multinational companies. The links are with Narayana Health for medical manpower and subsidized treatment. The government health projects like Sishu Shanti program, which is one of the interesting programs, anybody below the age of 18 actually are entitled to have free heart operations under this program. So it is so very important that the children are picked up with proper heart disease who are enrolled in the program. If you do not know that somebody has a heart problem, this program is of no good. And we refer patients to the government tertiary care hospitals for surgical treatment, which is also at a very, very low cost. So the annual report card of 2015-16 is we have seen about 1,200 heart patients since October 2014. The EOPD started twice a week, seeing about 40 to 50 patients a month. And approximately 2,000 heart patients per year would receive access to tertiary care heart facilities. And we have health awareness talks spread in each camps. So I have a message from Dr. Shetty on September 12, 2016, where he says, that I would like to congratulate the Manipur Rural Healthcare Foundation for organizing heart camps to screen patients for heart disease since 2014. He believes that I am sure hundreds of patients are benefited by the heart camps organized by MRHF and I wish many more organizations in the country follow the example of MRHF. And I would like to thank all the trustees and organizers of the heart camps under the MRHF and our doctors who actively participate in these camps. So this is a very encouraging message which we received from Dr. Shetty himself. So today we have four heart camps a year, EOPD on a regular basis, we diagnose heart problems, we follow up patients and we have seen about 1200 patients. Looking ahead, what we would like to acquire is diagnostic facilities like basic blood tests, ECG machines, extra machines so that we can subsidize the cost for the tests, CSR funding from the MNC and we hope for some grants as well. The way forward has to be innovation of work process required rather than new technological development. I always believed in that. The funding models again has to be self-sustained rather than depending on donations. And the, since the work is more on diagnostics and follow-up based expenditure and infrastructure cost is expected to be low. The way forward again is the involvement of more like-minded professionals, training of paramedics as with urban at local level. So if you train the paramedics at the local level, you have a chance of high participation <coughs> of these people. If you have people going over from cities, the chances that it will probably wean off after a while. So that we are already tying up with some government institutions who are going to train these paramedics. Need to identify specialty hospitals who provide quality care at a subsidized cost in the vicinity and obviously the micro insurance which is one of the very important areas which Dr. Shetty's model has very successfully done in Bangalore with the farmers. This is the untold story before I sign off. This is a 12 year old girl who came to see, uh, who came actually with her grandfather who need, needed to be shown in the camp and she was just presenting a flower to me. So when I saw her, I thought she was a little underdeveloped for a 12 year old or 11 year old girl. So I asked her father as to how is she and she said, he said that she was absolutely okay except that she didn't participate in any sports or any activities in the schools. So when I examined her, I found a murmur in her heart. So the first time actually any doctor has seen her. And then we brought her over, we did an echocardiography and we found that she actually has a hole in the heart. She came with her grandfather and now she was a patient. She has been operated last month under the Sishashati program without any, without any cost and she is well today. This is one of the stories which I thought I'd like to share with you and many more stories of a similar kind are going to evolve in the next few years. So to conclude, uh, this is a very humble beginning and this journey is to continue. Thank you. Questions, please. Um, so you talked about the um, question uh, to attract the uh, best doctors in rural areas. Do you know uh, how you can do it? Uh, because you told us that you, you, you 
where the lower uh, income should call in and if we have Yeah, actually what I tried to say that ours is going to be more of a diagnostic. We need to pick up problems rather than you know the treating problems. So even if we have doctors with basic qualification, we don't need very highly skilled doctors to do that. So basically we require these persons to come with me and diagnose the problems with the ECGs, the echocardiograms, the x-rays and once we have the diagnosis done, we have a process through which they can actually go to different areas and have treatment done either free of cost or at subsidized cost. So the NH group which I work with, we have plenty of doctors and we have heart camps on a very very regular basis. So I do not have any problems in acquiring these junior doctors to travel with me for the heart camps. Uh, in the clips you showed, uh, you were connecting to the patients in real time. And I suppose the patients were from uh, villages. So, uh, and I think in most of the villages there is an issue of connectivity in terms of uh, there is no like proper internet connection. So how do you like cope with the challenge? I will be very surprised to know actually that uh, a lot of villages uh, actually have proper connectivity now. Only thing that we don't utilize it for the proper reasons. Because a lot of villages, they have people who are actually working in the urban cities now. Particularly this village which is so remote, has a 4 Mbps connection where I work with. You have people with smartphones there, but no health access. So that is a huge gap which we need to bridge. So I thought that the communication areas which we have today in WhatsApp and you know, I mean Skype and other video conferencing, to utilize that to the best of the effect to, to solve this problem. It's not regard to Mohanapur, uh, World Health Foundation, it's regard to uh, Dr. Shade. So, you talked about his leadership style. I want you to know what makes people stick with him stick with Dr. Shetty. I think it's a belief, you know, I mean, uh, uh, one thing is that, you know, there are a couple of reasons, I think, you know, when you start off, start off with him, you will not get a better exposure in terms of numbers and volumes and the independence compared to, say, any other private hospitals. Um, but uh, my thing is that uh, you can this stick for lifetime. Yeah, I'm coming to that. So this is the beginning. So once you have acquired the skill, and once you are comfortable with the volumes, you would rather like to stay in a place who has given you the start rather than going somewhere else. We have people who have gone elsewhere and actually have come back. Because in corporate hospitals, it's a very tough life. And I don't want to you know, I mean, say all these things, but there are few difficulties which people face in typical corporate hospitals where you have targets to achieve and I don't believe in medical targets. I, I never believed in it. So this is one hospital or one institution under his leadership, under his vision, where we do not have targets. We have actually more targets than what we can actually do. The workload which we have is much higher compared to any other hospitals in the country, I would believe, in the, in the, in the private sector. And if you talk to Dr. Shetty, it's very difficult to say no to him. That's one of his challenges, you know, it's a very magnetic personality he has. Considering the, uh, the size of Narendra Dhade right now, yeah. people who join at a, at a, at a big initial, initial level, they might end up leaving the hospital after gaining experience. No, we are not, you know, it's not that we are uh, badly paid, except that we have to work hard. Now everybody wants to work hard, I believe, you know, I mean, any, any doctor who has work in his hand would like to work hard. I think if you are not doing anything, that's the worst thing as a medical profession. If you didn't have much work in your hand. And the other thing I'd like to say is that if you ever have to do an NGO or these kind of activities, it's better to do it when you are at the peak of your prowess rather than when you are retired. Because today, at my physical activity level, at my mental acumen, I think I'm at the peak of my prowess. And I have the contacts, I have all the 
necessary things which is required. So when you retire at the age of 60, 70, 70, 75, everything will be diminished. And I think you require a leader who actually is at the peak. Yes, why should the poorest um, children, the poorest uh, patients, to finance their care? Do you use micro insurance or what? No, as I mentioned, for the children we don't have a problem because we have a government scheme where every child under the age of 18 is assured of free heart surgeries. And those surgeries are done in private hospitals and government hospitals. So there's no issue on that at all. All we have to do is to pick up and to diagnose the problem. And from there on, there's a process which is absolutely free of cost. Structure. The structure of Nand you are saying that everyone uh, is not given any target or they don't have any set objectives to meet. Financial targets, I mean. We don't need to think about that. We need to see patients. We need to operate, but we don't have any financial targets to meet. So you probably know what are financial targets in hospitals. You know, there are pharmacy bills. We don't need to mention those. Some of them are fictitious, discovered only after the patient dies. So that's part of the. We walk. Process. We walk into the hospital, put our scrub suits, and by the time we are finished, it's evening. We don't know actually anything else. When we meet with administration, it's always actually about putting pressure on them to, you know, subsidize things. It is not the other way around. And how is it if uh, we are putting pressure on them, then how is it financially viable? That's up to you to solve. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's a volume. It's a volume thing. You see, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, when you are spending 5 crores on a machine, just imagine that you are, you, you are putting up a cat lab in a hospital, which is going to cost you about 15 20 crores. And Five crores you are going to put on the machine. Today, Narana Vizala has the power of actually not buying the machine at all. They just park the machine there and it's profit share. Again, in that uh, parking a machine, but I said it is like renting a machine. Is it's not rent, it's a kind of profit share. It's, it's volumes. With Arvind, with Narayan Vidala, it is a volume game. If the volume is not there, the whole thing will collapse. I think it's volume. And the other thing is inspiration. You know, in this course, we can actually talk about the fact we have management theories of motivation. But what is at play here is inspiration. As Dr. Dev said, same trees are mother trees are rather inspired Dr. Devi Shetty. And he dreamt in his own way. You know, so after that dream and see how he's catalyzed it. Dr. Dev could have just been a good doctor in RTIICS. Very successful, he's already a very successful uh, cardiologist, very well known in India and the world, and you know, pre presented papers at conferences. Instead, he's going to rural Bengal, trying to set up a new experiment. If that succeeds, it could be a scalable model for the whole state, for many remote villages. So, see the catalytic effect of one leader, one Mother Teresa catalyzing so many things. So that is very important, the leadership or if this domain is very different from corporate leadership. It's a virtuous cycle you build. He's saying that you, you put pressure on administration to subsidize. So there is a constant thing, how can I do more for the poor? How can I do more for the underprivileged? How can I stretch my resources? This is a lovely environment to work. Yes, absolutely. Because you see, I mean, when we talk about subsidization to the management. The first thing they will hit me is on my fees. And if I am prepared to actually forego the fees, you have very little chance of saying no to me. Yeah. Yeah, because given the disparity of the number of doctors required by the World Health Organization, WHO, and the number of doctors we have, I believe, and, and the other problem is that people 
or the doctors from the city don't want to go into the rural areas for different reasons, for different valid reasons. So e-health is something which I can sit at the comfort of my chamber in my hospital and they are sitting at their end and we can discuss the same thing. That's number one. Number two, for a 15 minute consultation, you have to travel say 200 kilometers from where you are to see me in my outdoor, in OPD. And what you are doing is in fact cramming up spaces for more new patients to be seen. If I see 50 patients, because I have a limit of how many patients I can see a day, maybe 50, maybe 100. Out of that, if 70% patients are my old patients, then you are actually depriving 70 more new patients to be seen. So if I can see these patients for them without traveling there, and in my own time, then it's much easier and it's a better model, I believe, which is going to come in the years to come. There was somebody else who had a question? Yeah. Um, do you know, you explained that uh, part of your funding comes from CSR activities by a multinational company. Do you know the approximate share uh, of the total funds that is coming from these CSR activities? It's about 50-50 uh, now. 50-50? Yeah, 50% from there and 50% self-funding. Okay. Yeah. For the e-health camps, were you able to connect with the other urban doctor, urban cardiologists? No, it's a, it's a very it's in a very nascent stage. Uh, I do the whole e-consultation right now, and once uh, I think that you know the number exceeds what I can do, more people will join in. And I, it's, a, it, it's something which you know I I believe that I want this fire to ignite more minds rather than it, it could be different model, but if it's a kind of a similar model. People will benefit, I believe. Yes. So are the doctors uh, adapting to weekend uh, using this technology? E health is not new. E, e health is uh, pretty, you know, it's been happening for quite some time the telecardiology and e health. And uh, only the conferences they, on a global level is happening for the last four or five years. But whether other doctors are doing it with such rural. Uh, practice or not, I am not very sure. Particularly in Bengal, this is the first time this is happening that we are connecting with such rural masses. Uh, we will see how it goes, you know, I mean, we, we are not sure, I am not sure how things are, but acceptance has been very good, particularly in the place where I go, and now we are covering a population of close to about 15 lakhs. In the area from where the patients are coming now, but to this particular minor area. Yes. Yeah, I mean what we are trying to do is uh, get these patients to our hospital. And uh, this particular uh, village where I go, they have a bus service which comes from the village to Calcutta twice a day. And the owner of that bus service actually he has he is one of my patients and he has told that any patients who come from his village or surroundings to Calcutta and going back, he's not going to charge them. So we we have more people, you know, it's it's all about good people on this earth which creates this earth and keeps it going. Okay, we need to conclude now. Um, uh, before we conclude, I'll just share a little story. Dr. Dave talked about compelling personal histories. Since the group didn't mention it, uh, Dr. V started his journey when he was a five or six year old boy. In the village, in the house next, a pregnant woman died. And that made that little five year old, six year old child sit up and think, why does a lady have to die while giving childbirth. So much so that he persisted. He persisted so much that he became a trained obstetrician. And look at that, his rheumatism, which would have crippled anybody else, didn't cripple him. He started after retirement and built the largest eye care facility in the world. Look at today, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, personal physician of Mother Teresa for a few years, created a vision that went far beyond his original scheme of being just a good cardiac surgeon. It's benefiting so many people in this country and even beyond. And more important, look at the catalytic effect that it's generating 
And today, Dr. Shetty is complimenting Moinapur Rural Health Foundation for the outreach programs it's generating because it's another new dimension beyond what he's already trying to do. So look at the ripple effect, the virtual cycle, the inspiration, and the kind of leadership, and the kind of world that NGOs live in. A very warm note of thanks to you, Dr. Dev, for making this. You know, you could show your passion. Your passion came alive. I'm sure it ignited a few minds here. I hope so, at least. To do something beyond your normal call of duty when you are in your business life. And be a great messenger of change. If you can bring change in however little way in your lives, it will not just benefit you and your families, but you will be thanked by hundreds of thousands of people who will smile after they receive whatever they receive. Can I just ask you to cut a small little token of our appreciation? It's very little, but Dr. Singh, today is deprived many patients in our PIICF because he had to come and see you.